live. Hey, we're live. Hi, everyone. Uh, it's Emil Guillermo. Emil, I'm up to you. Uh, my green screen sort of uh, messed up a little bit or my virtual screen. So I'm hanging up. I'm in my closet. And of course, when you're in your closet, you look for all your Filipiniana, right? This is where I hang up all my Filipiniana. So I, of course, the gong is always there. The gong is is always there but we also have this counts as american filipiniana this is a benny agbayani jersey benny agbayani from hawaii went to st louis high school right which is the the factory of all these great athletes including if i'm not mistaken Tua Tagovailoa, right who is not playing today for the dolphins that's right. He's probably listening to this podcast. No. Benny Agbayani played for the New York Mets and was known as a Hawaiian punch, right? And he, he was an everyday player, unlike the first Filipino American to play in Major League Baseball. That would be Bobby Belsina, who came up through the minor leagues played in the Hawaii minor leagues for the Honolulu Beach Boys, I believe. And then this is in the 50s. Got what they call a a a cup of coffee. You know, he, he got the September call up to try to see if he could make the team with the St. Louis Browns, I believe. And uh, he, he didn't stick or he played a little bit, but he didn't stick. But he was the first, the first Filipino American, Filipino American, because he was born, I believe he was born in San Pedro, California. California. Bobby Belsina in the 50s. And not since Bobby Belsina have you seen um, a major league athlete, Filipino, like that in baseball. Well, until Benny Agbayani in 2000. And then, of course, the we claim we claim him because he's part Filipino. Probably half, maybe, maybe less, though. No, I think his mother, his mother's Filipino. Tim Linscombe, the best bar none Filipino American baseball player. Ever. Double Cy Young, two no hitters, World Series rings. There's no question. Tim Linscombe. Right. But Benny was a Benny was a, um, a an everyday position player. And boy, he was like a little dynamo. He'd lift his leg up like Sada Haruo, the Japanese player who hit all the, the home runs. Benny hit some home runs against the Giants when he played for the Mets. And uh, Benny, of course, his last name means hero so i mean how can you knock that it is a, he's a hero right okay so um we're here and i'm going to share my screen uh because let's see i i'd like to share my screen because i, I want to talk about giving tuesday uh, you know you guys have been so kind to the the museum oh once again this is our museum pop-up i call it uh you know, if you're if you're having Filipino brunch, you know, they call it topsalog or, you know, that's where you put an egg on top of something, usually rice and tapa. I guess that's why they call it topsalong. God, tapa. You know, my mom made tapa. That was like that. That was like you were going you were going to heaven if you had to. That was my Sunday meal. I would watch the Raiders on on Sunday morning when they played on the East coast, remember the Heidi game. Now people of a certain age will remember the Heidi game, the Raiders, Daryl Monica, and they were playing, uh, they were playing the jets 
and the game was truncated, cut off at the end because they had to go to the Heidi. Heidi had to play on prime time. And many people didn't see the game. Anyway, I just remember at the beginning of that game, as it was all, always the case for Sunday morning, West Coast football fans, I, my mom would make tapa. And we didn't, we forgot the salog. We forgot, I don't know, just give me the tapa and the rice and the goods. Get that grease and the garlic and the, see, I'm talking like a vegan now, aren't I? I, I am. I'm a vegan. I, I'm speaking nostalgically, sentimentally about my meat eating Filipino ness. But I swear that was like, that, that's like comfort food to me. Sitting with my TV tray, with my mound of rice, and my surrounded by bits of this tapa that my mother would make, knowing that this would comfort her, her young son. I think I might have been 10 or 11 or something like that. She would present it to me. I would thank her, you know, profusely and then watch the Raiders play on Sunday morning. And that, that was a ritual. Anyway, so Sunday, it, it's evolved into Sunday brunch here at the museum. We're closed, of course, so you got to bring it virtually. And I hope you brought some. I actually tried to cook lumpia last night. My wife and I were preparing the filling and I, she kind of did most of it. And then she wrapped it and she, she keeps thinking it's a burrito that it has to be big and thick. And I said, no, 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 no. You got to make these things like little fingers, like, you know, like little cigars. And then I, I remember, I remember the sixties. So there I was folding the rolling, the lumpia wrapper. And they were like little, little bitty cigars, you know, they were, they, they looked so cute. Anyway. So I, we had our, we had, we, we, here's the thing. They're a vegetarian. And then you got to put them, you got to put these things in a, uh, in an air fryer. Otherwise you have like really greasy uh, lumpia, which you don't want greasy lumpia. I mean, do you want greasy lumpia? I don't think you want greasy lumpia. I raise your hands if you want greasy lumpia. No, no, no. You got to get an air fryer. Have someone send you an air fryer or gift you. I have no, I have, I have no interest, financial interest in this at all. Only interested in your health. If you're going to eat the bad Filipino food, get a darn air fryer because it works. You can cut out the oil, save your heart live at least five years longer, at least five years longer with or without lumpia, but probably you can, because you're living five years longer with the air fryer, you can have more lumpia. So we cooked this lumpia. It was great, except yeah, the wrappers are not, you know, they're, they're like, this was a vegan vegan filling and a vegan egg roll wrapper. So you can't really call it an egg roll wrapper, but we got it from a mainstream supermarket. So, you know, it wasn't like um, a Filipino brands. It was egg roll, right? In this case, a non egg egg roll and nothing like my mom would make. And if you know something about, about, you know, lumpia wrappers, lumpia wrappers are like, that's like the main event, right? You got to have the housing before you stick the, you know, the, the filling, the balat, the balat is everything, but how you make balat, I don't know. A lot of people make it too thick. They make it too paste and you know, they start out with a, they end up with a, or they start out with a ball of dough and then they roll it. And they, that is not the way my mom made it. You start out with a cast iron, cast iron pan, right? And if you had like a double boiler, that would help. You kind of steam these things. You, you flip, she, my mom flipped the pan over on the bottom side. So the bottom side was up and she took this flour and water batter and she just, she brushed it. She took a brush and she brushed it on the, on the bottom of the pan. 
And that pan was on top of a boiling pot and it would steam through and create this white thing, this white wrapper, the balat. And, and you know, it, she'd, you know, brush it on, the balat would be there. You take it off carefully and then put it on a, a plate. And she made about, I know, 500 of them. I know because uh, I would try to sneak a blot off to like eat it off myself, you know, in the corner. And she said, no, 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 don't do that. Don't do that. Okay, mom. Okay. All right. Now you got 498. I'm sorry. So she'd make them because she got paid. This was like her thing. She made doilies and she made blot. That's, I mean, I know there are more accomplished Filipino women out there, but you know, not more accomplished than my mom. I mean, I know there were scientists and doctors and all that kind of stuff, but my mom, she made balat and tapa. That was mother of the year. Come on. So anyway, um, I'm just talking about Filipino food because we talk about, okay, this is Sunday brunch. What are you having for Sunday brunch? Let me see if I can smell it out the door. Oh, no garlic here. Okay. Uh, well, yeah, because I remember growing up in San Francisco, uh, we, we'd always go to my Uncle Joe's house. He lived on McAllister at the time. And we'd go up the steps of these big flats they had there. And you could just, you just attracted to the smell of toyo and garlic frying in the pan. You hear the garlic and maybe they got a couple of longanisas out there. And you're just, you're just walking straight to the kitchen, right? Those San Francisco railroad flats. A anyway, just uh, these are the memories I have on Sunday morning. So when I say, hey, bring your own food, I mean, yeah, you can, you can bring your own, have it sizzling, you know, have the computer on, play this on your phone. Let's see what Emil has to do here for the museum. Because, look, we're only doing this. We're doing this because... The museum is closed again, again, but again, we have to be, oh my goodness. We're uh, look at how many people have died across the country and don't let anyone tell you it's a hoax, you know, mask up. I mean, I, I like to mask up even here, even here. I like to mask up, you know, look, I'm a vegan. I've come with my own V my, my, my own salad sneeze plate. Uh, you know, so, you know, I got, a bunch of these so they come in handy but they work they work and then you got your mask on underneath they work that they work anyway the museum's closed and it's sad it said we we can't we wanted to be open but all i noticed yesterday as i gave our our little our little uh, chat a little pop up a bunch of museums around the bay area uh, we're in Stockton, the museums in Stockton, but the Asian Art Museum closed, Museum of Modern Art closed. They're all closed now. They they can't, they they could not. It was like wishful thinking to think that they could stay stay up. And they've got millions of dollars in their endowment, right? I mean, they can they can handle this. Uh, we can't handle this as much. I mean, we're a little microorg micro org and we rely on your help and we we do these virtual pop-ups just as a way to to check in and say here we are hi <laughs> hi everyone we're talking about filipino american history because the filipino american national historical society museum it, it's it's where you are when we're virtual it's wherever you are you know be it hampton roads texas seattle new york chicago Southern California, Northern California, Bay Area, Stockton, Sacramento. We're where you are. And uh, you can go to our Fonz Museum page on Facebook. Facebook Live. We're Facebook Live now. Uh, you can catch the replay. You ought to catch this live, though, because, you know, it's, it's live. It's like, oh, it's like, it's like I'm almost, I'm there. I'm, 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 I'm there with a the meal. And he did something with his light today. What, what, what's going on, Emil? Uh, you know, you can do that. I mean, you can put it in chat and say, yeah, come on. What's going on, Emil? 
and if I can, like, if my, my system doesn't crash, I can see your, <laughs> I can see your notes. Are you, and this is interactive. It's supposed to be interactive. You can say, you can send me a message. Usually I get to them afterwards, but anyway, uh, we, we are here because we want to check in with you at like virtually open the doors and say, come on, let's consider, let's think about Filipino American history. Let, let's think about our stories. Let's think about that timeline that I like to mention that goes from 1587 uh, on to uh, 1898, 1587, the first Filipinos, 1898, the rebel, uh, the uh, uh, Philippines colonized by the United States. And then uh, onwards to 1904, the, the World's Fair, the Filipinos come, Human Zoo, uh, 1920s or 1906, the cicadas go to Hawaii, 1930, 40,000 Filipinos, men and women, but the ratio was 14 to one, men to women. They come to America mostly as workers. You have 1934 tidings, McDuffie says, hey, hey, you Filipinos, you thought you were American? No, no, no more. You're now aliens again. And they forced them to repatriate. 1941, the war, World War II, we're gonna talk about that a little today. A big deal. The war in the Philippines, people answered the call. They they were promised citizenship. 1946, they were denied citizenship because of the Rescission Act. A long drought, 1965, more Filipinos allowed to enter, more Filipino families allowed to start. 1965, it was the Immigration Act. Oop, of 65. Oh, I lost the light there. <laughs> well, okay, there, there went my light. There went, oh, that, that light's gone. Okay, so I'm just doing, I'm just going on the screen light here. Oh, here, now, now I, I got, and I don't know what happened. That was weird. 1965, Immigration Act. 1965, Larry Itliong, the Delano strike. Not Cesar Chavez, Larry Itliong. And then really since the 70s, it's the buildup of a Filipino American middle class and Filipino Americans trying to break through discrimination, the same kind of discrimination they faced all throughout from the 20s, the 30s, the 40s, but trying to cast their lot and, and really stake their ground in American society these last 50 years. You could say from the Civil Rights Act and the realization that people, you know, saw that Filipino Americans as Asian Americans count are covered by that Civil Rights Act. That's what we've been trying to fight. You hear of glass ceiling. That's what we're trying to fight. Everyone's story fits into that timeline, wherever you are. You know, no matter what you do, you're a nurse, you're a doctor, you're an accountant, you're in business, you're in small business, you're in the corporate world, you're an artist. Everyone has a story that fits in that timeline. And that's what we talk about. Those are the stories we tell, but those are the things we celebrate here at the Philippine American National Historical Society Museum. And because we can't be with you or can't open the doors and say, come on in and look at our exhibit. We have a 1500 square foot gallery that the landlord insists on getting rent. Uh, we're cut off from you. We're cut off from, fortunately, not necessarily cut off from your donations, but this is one way we can help tell the story. And hopefully you can respond by going to our Fonz Facebook page. That's at Facebook at Fonz, F-A-N-H-S, Museum, Fonz Museum. And today I put something in there because Tuesday is Giving Tuesday. And if you make a donation on our Giving Tuesday post, we will get a matching donation, some kind of matching formula imposed by Facebook. And it'll help raise more money for us. 
I know it sounds like, oh, we gave. I, I know you gave. And that's what we told. That's what we tell our landlord. We gave last month. Oh, we got to pay this month, too. OK, uh, see, it's a never ending thing. But we're a small organization. We're transparent. None of us get paid. All volunteer. We do it because we love. No, we do it because it's our story. It's our it's our blood. Uh, we need you to be our Agbayani, be our hero, and go to those. Uh, go to the Facebook Giving Tuesday on our Facebook Fonz Museum page. Click on that. It's a picture of Don Babalan. And um, consider a donation. We don't need a big one. Uh, a lot of this is if we have a lot of people giving a little bit, sort of like the way the way it usually works. You know, a lot giving a little adds up, helps the museum stay afloat, helps us tell your story. Be our Agbayani, be our hero. Go to that post. I put it up last night. We have one donation so far, so far, but we should have more. So please consider that. And I thank you. I, I know that if you, I didn't go to my regular donors, people who've always answered the call, friends of mine who aren't Filipino, but you know, this is not just a, you have to be Filipino kind of thing. If you believe in the, in helping an essentially invisible group of people tell their story and let everyone know their story. That's what you're doing when you donate to the museum. That's what telling Filipino American history is. Most of this, no one knows. Most of this, everyone says, they had a war with the Philippines? Oh, we, we were colon colonized? Like, like Rhode Island was a colon, what, what colon, colonization? See, people don't understand, they don't get it. But we try to fill in the gaps. You know, we put your story in the timeline, but a lot of people don't even have a timeline. A lot of people don't know that these gaps exist. Hence the need for our Filipino American National Historical Society Museum in Stockton, California, wherever you are, like I said, uh, not just in California, but around the, the country, around the world, please consider your fully tax deductible gift. Be our hero, please. I know it sounds like, uh, like, a, like an NPR pitch, huh? Kind of. Well, I was on NPR. I they never made me pitch when I was on NPR. I never, I said, I don't have to beg. Oh no, we, uh, other people beg. You could just, just go on the mic and read the news. But, you know, it's important because you know when you're pitching, people believe in it. And we believe in it. The small band of volunteers, if you want to volunteer, it's time and treasure, right? Uh, we'll take your treasure. We'll take your time too. Email us, <clears throat> leave us a message on the Facebook page. Always use volunteers especially those tech ones. Okay, so Don is important. Um, they say a, a couple of things. You know, coming up is a big thing. December 7th. It's, it's a week away, but we can't speak enough about how significant World War II was in terms of the Philippines and Filipino Americans, because the Philippines, right, was a colony. They were under attack too. And the Filipinos there, you say, hey, that's Filipino history. No, that's Filipino American history. They were people in the military, but also if they were there, they ultimately had to live through all that. And then ultimately they did come and immigrate to America. Many of them. I mean, some stayed, yes, but many of them came here to America. And this is part of their Filipino American history. So 
I, I just want to take some time to read something from, I, I, I mentioned Dhamma Balan a lot because God, you know, I, I, I have her book and she signed my book and I should have maybe made it more pristine, but this shows that I actually use her book. It's like, it's, I wouldn't call it the Bible. It's almost better than the, no, I always say it's, nothing's better than the Bible. Sorry. Sorry. No, it's, uh, but this is Don's book, little Manila is in the heart. And she, she had that book signing at the, uh, hotel Stockton, Stockton hotel, you know, the place that should be like, I mean, it should be our gathering place, but, and it has been, she signed her book. She says for a meal who literally helped us save little Manila. I can't thank you enough for all your love and support. Love John. Seven thirteen, thirteen. 13, Stockton. You know, she was a, an important kid, much younger than me. I remember when she first came on the scene, I was in a, at a Filipino function and there was this Don, you know, this ball of energy with her little, she had, she was in a video, her movie camera, taking pictures of everything, documenting everything. I said, who is that person? Tell her to stop working so hard. No, I didn't say that. I did not say that, but I, I might've thought it. No, no, I didn't. I, I just said, she's going somewhere at Don Rabalin. Damn. And the day she died made big news about the Filipino American community. Anyway. So, uh, you know, I read, I read from Dawn's book today because she got it. She knew how important world war II was. And so let me go to, I'm going to share screen here, share my screen. And uh, we're here on Zoom, pushing this out. And look at all this. Look at all these things here. Okay, and I I'm going to share my screen. This is Kindle, right? And um, you should get the book. If you don't have it, you should get it. Chapter 6, toward the end of the book. It's, it's, a, it's a key... You got to you got to understand what it meant, and this is why we're going to read a little bit today, and then we're going to read a little bit on December, you know, next weekend, because December seventh, when Pearl Harbor happens, I I think you got to understand what that meant. You know, it wasn't just Pearl Harbor. You know, the the base in Hawaii was attacked. Honolulu was attacked. 10 hours later, the Japanese took over the Philippines. That's the thing. People usually leave that out. Oh, the Philippines too? I thought we just bombed a couple ships in Honolulu. I saw that on my last vacation. Yes, I know you saw that in your last vacation, but the Japanese went to the Philippines 10 hours later and took over there. Oh, so that's how the Philippines got involved. Yes, that's how the Philippines got involved. And that's how we get World War II stories like Corregidor and Bataan. Pearl Harbor Day. Big day. So I, I read this chapter six because it means a lot also to the Filipinos here in America. And this is uh, Don writing in her book. Let's see, I'm going to move some things here so I can read it. On December 10th, 1943, the writer Carlos Bulasan sent a telegram to one of his great idols, the author and diplomat Carlos P. Romula. Romula was a great man who had been an aide-de-camp to General Douglas MacArthur and with him had watched the Philippines fall to the Japanese. Previously, Romula served as the Philippine Commonwealth Secretary in Information and Public Relations. Enthusiasm, this is bullets on writing. Enthusiasm of your coming to California is growing rapidly among our countrymen, especially in Stockton, Sacramento areas, where American organizations and business groups are waiting for your presence, wrote Bullison in the telegram. 
Willison promised Romulo an audience of 5,000 people and offered him contacts and assistance for his West Coast tour. On April 9, 1944, to mark the second anniversary of the brutal Bataan death march, Romulo paid the highly anticipated official visit to the Stockton Filipino community to drum up support for the war bond effort. This is April 9, 1944. Romulo finally comes. Thousands of Filipinos in Stockton attended the event at the Stockton Civic Auditorium because they ached to hear firsthand accounts of the war in the Philippines. Romulo discovered or described in graphic terms the horror. Oops, the horror of the, of the Bataan Death March and the brutality suffered by whites and Filipinos together. Quote, in the foxholes of Bataan, one would see a handsome blonde American boy and a handsome black haired Filipino boy, their, their bodies lying in grotesque positions, their blood freely intermingling in the dust in the sacred cause of freedom, brothers and comrades in arms. Ramulo then admonished whites to embrace Filipinos as their own brothers, take them into their hearts as the 17 million Filipinos took into their hearts the 7,000 American soldiers who fought for you, for us, for freedom in Bataan. Don't discriminate against them. Please smile at them when you meet them in your street. This is Romulo trying to convince people that, hey, Filipinos are all right. Right, we come through era, uh, decades of discrimination. Now the war comes up and Japan has occupied the Philippines. And now, and now what, right? Now we're here in America, the Filipinos are here in America are seen not as the people to be discriminated against. They're seen as brothers suddenly, which was a new thing. They did not consider us brothers heretofore. It may be as people who stole their women and stole their jobs, but not brothers. Romulo's frank talk inspired thousands of Filipinos in Stockton who were chafing under white supremacy. This is Don. These are Don's word, chafing under white supremacy. That's what it was like. Oh, we're choking. Chafing, oh, Burns. Camilo Carrido felt that Romulo had sent a stinging message to local whites. If Romulo didn't come here and ball out the people over here, they would have still been prejudiced to us, said Camilo Carrido. He tells them American people died in their arms and that's the way you treat them? Asuncion Nicolás, who spent her adolescence and adulthood in Stockton and San Francisco, remembered the marked difference in the ways that Filipinos in Stockton were treated, particularly after Romulo's speech. The government saw the bravery and the devotion of our Filipino people during the war, she remembered. Indeed, World War II was a watershed moment for Filipinos in Stockton. And so Don talks about her chapter, uh, talks about the changing fortunes of the Stockton Filipino community during World War II and in the years immediately after it. The chapter first considers the community in the late 30s, the nature of anti-Filipino racism in the period, and the burgeoning labor movement. Labor, you can't have a labor movement unless people see you as real. They see you as human beings. They see you as not as animals that they can enslave, that they can you know, do, you know, treat less than human. There's a labor movement because we are beginning to be recognized as humans. Then Don says uh, the chapter then examines how Filipino life in Stockton changed with the bombing of Pearl Harbor, the advent of war in the Pacific, particularly the Philippines and the internment of Japanese Americans. Now, I will read from this next week. And I was actually amazed, amazed at the subtle difference. You would think, was there solidarity? All the Asians, Chinese, Japanese, Filipino? Those of you in Hawaii know about how far that solidarity goes. 
not as far as one would think, right? And actually, when I read this chapter, and I re reread it again last night, I was actually surprised because I never really saw it as, as nuanced as Don presents it here. Because, look, it's still a Darwinian kind of society. And we're fighting for approval, for our status, for our, our place. And sometimes it means that we are more against each other than with each other. Hard to believe, but Dawn explains in her book. So Dawn says, she argues that the war presented an opportunity for Filipinas, for Filipinos. She does that Filipina, as uh, O's. She wasn't around for the Philippines, the Philippinxes, or Philippinxos. No, the, just the Philippinex. That, that's the whole thing about gender and language, right? Another discussion. We can deal with the race stuff here first. But she says <clears throat> the war presented an opportunity for Filipinos to move beyond factionalism, reposition themselves in regard to the racial hierarchy in the San Joaquin Delta area and stake their claim on Stockton as their home. The development of a more cohesive Filipino community, the burgeoning strength of the Filipino labor movement, the opportunities in labor and business provided by the forced removal of Japanese and Japanese Americans during World War II, and the changing attitudes of whites toward Filipinos in Stockton gave them more power and resources than ever before in San Joaquin County throughout the 40s and 50s. And wouldn't you know, after the war ended and people came to Stockton, made their home, the Filipino American community, many of them were able to start their families right there in the 50s and, and later. And that's how you see the group of Filipino Americans that you do today, the kind of hierarchy that exists or the kind of social uh, kind of standing that exists between generations, right? The 50s and 60s, that's when people were allowed to come in. Excuse me. And that, that's when people were allowed to, uh, to be Filipino and have families. Here's a, here's a key point. Goals that had seemed elusive prior to the war were almost immediately realized in the aftermath of Pearl Harbor, most specifically land ownership, citizenship rights, and labor justice. Think about that. Land ownership. Hey, you get to own the farm, you get to own your house. Citizenship rights. Think about that. You're, you're a citizen. Labor justice, 10 cents an hour? Not if there's labor justice. So you see how this is, she's talking about 40s and 50s. You see how when Larry Itleon comes around in 1960, how important that was in terms of marrying the civil rights issues of the day, right? I mean, because the blacks, we're really behind the push for civil rights and voting rights in the South, right? But who, I mean, and, and their ag, right, resulted in, in, uh, in the slavery, right? Their, their, their uh, connection to ag was, goes back to 1619, right? But who were the economic slaves of the 60s? The guy's working for 10 cents an hour out in the fields in California, the Filipinos. And what was Larry Itleong's role? To start that strike and merge labor rights with the civil rights movement of the time in 65 for people to see, hey, we're all in this fighting 
for equality and justice. We're not, we didn't leave the fields. Fields are still there. The inequities are still there. And we need to right those wrongs. That's the importance of Larry Idleong, but it was all empowered by this new framework of how Filipino Americans were seen. World War II did it. So imagine when she says the changing attitudes of white sort Filipinos, you know, what seemed elusive before the war, now was almost immediately realized. So I, I didn't want to bring up World War II too soon or Pearl Harbor too soon because it is a day that will live in infamy. But it's worth thinking about what December 1st and 2nd and 3rd and 4th and 5th and 6th and, 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 then, and then the surprise attack. What were those days prior to? What were they like? And, and how did that change? with Pearl Harbor. Think about those days leading up to December 7th. Discriminated against, treated poorly. The war happened, December 7th, Pearl Harbor, day that lives in infamy. And yet for Filipinos, maybe not infamy, but a, a day to demark because it means Things are changing for Filipino Americans, especially in Stockton. You know, it's sort of a dramatic change. You know, if this is normal, normal life or treated with, you know, by racist, discriminated against, white supremacy. The war changes everything and sets us into another direction. Good or bad? Well, we just know it was different from before, before Pearl Harbor. Something to think about. And it, you could see this in points of history, how, thing, how these things change. And next week, I will read from some passages from Don's book that, that made me think, hey, you know, there's some things were different. The union movement, the labor militancy and unity there. And then also how Filipinos and Chinese and Japanese got together and how they, how they were somehow changed because of World War II. I have never heard anyone say that there were some Filipinos who actually were for the internment camps. It would be politically incorrect to say that today. And yet there were, and I think that from Don's scholarship and from what people said during the time, it'll surprise you how people saw the internment in the Filipino community. So I'll talk about that next week. Um, because, you know, I, I, I love doing these things for you, but I, I think well, I'm just opening the door. I'm opening the, the door to just looking at history and looking at your place in history. So you can imagine yourself in that timeline. Just drop yourself in the timeline or drop your parents or drop your, you know, and see how it affects your family history. Because it does. I mean until I realized what happened to my father, how my father came here to America in the 1928, until I saw what really that meant, I just thought he was just an awkwardly dressed brown dude. I, I didn't know that, you know, he was a Filipino guy who was seen and discriminated against. That, that didn't register to me until I got my history. So 
Hey, that's our pop-up for today, my friends. It's uh, so good to be here with you on a Sunday. Uh, if you missed it, catch it at the beginning uh, on the replay. You can find it on Facebook Live, on our Facebook Live page at the Fonz Museum Facebook Live page. You can also find it on YouTube, on our YouTube channel. Uh, Terry set that up. And, you know, Chris would ordinarily be here, but Chris has a fundraiser. Check out the fundraiser. Um, he's, he's doing the monthly fundraiser. Uh, I'm doing a giving Tuesday fundraiser, which is slightly different because he's got the whole month. This is just a, a Tuesday only thing. Uh, but if you donate to it, you, we get credit for every day is a Tuesday, but check it out on the Fonz museum, Facebook page, F A N H S museum. Uh, the post you'll see Don, she's sitting next to her book. And like I said, I, I'm sorry that I'm not really sorry, but this is one of the necessary things to, to ask for your help, to ask for your understanding. Um, we have like one or two grants, small grants to help with rent for maybe four months. But we've been closed eight months and looks like a 12th month and more if things don't change. Uh, I hope you had a great Thanksgiving. I hope you spent it with your family apart, maybe you Zoomed. Maybe you caught my, uh, my story yesterday, Zooming with my family members in San Francisco. They weren't that far, but they, I had some family members around the country. But it's... I hope you were socially distanced because we may see a spike, a spike that could send the death rates spiraling by the middle of the month. They say over 300,000. I mean, I was looking at some, some notes when I first started doing this. Um, there might have been just, you know, 10,000 deaths, 20, 000, you know, small number of deaths around the country. We're up to 260,000, right? And more plus. So please take care of yourselves. I mean, that's the reason why the museum is closed. But we try to open the doors and say, hey, we're virtual. I hope you get something from these stories and this analysis of what what's going on, reading from Don's book. And don't forget, uh, makes a great Christmas gift. And I think uh, we have some at the, the Fonz Museum bookstore. So I'm Emil Guillermo. Uh, oh, I, I do want to mention that on December 7th, I, this is more like a chat, more like a talk, but I, I also do a, a theater piece that I'm doing at the Marsh online and it's free so check out the marsh in san francisco the marsh i think it's the marsh.org uh or go to my website at amok.com and i'll have information on how you can attend it's free monday 7 30 at night pacific time i do my amok monologues a different covid version of the amok monologues on december 7th so Thank you very much for coming uh, today, checking this out, checking out, keeping the uh, museum in your mind, uh, listening to this, and back again next week with more. I'm Emil Guillermo. You can get in touch with me by uh, E-M-I-L-A-M-O-K at gmail.com directly, E-M-I-L-A-M-O-K, Emil Amok at gmail.com or leave a message on the box. And if I, I didn't get any messages today in the box, but I will afterwards. Thank you for your comments. It's Facebook and you know, the currency in Facebook is to like and to comment. So please like and comment as many times, ask a question. I will like and comment afterwards. Thank you for being here as uh, my, uh, late and lamented uh, friend would have said, uh, Professor Dama Balin would have said, till next time, mahals and salamats.